Uh, thank you everyone for joining at this uh, different time of day we've chosen in order to see who we could uh, invite and welcome from around the world, different time zones. For the Deep Adaptation Q&A this month, I'm very pleased that we've got the author of uh, the, the End of Ice, a book I'm, I'm reading at the moment. Uh, his name is Dar Jamal, and he's joining us from, uh, is it West Coast America or Canada, Dar? Uh, West Coast Trumpistan, right, America, oh. yeah. Okay, I didn't know it had been renamed yet. Um, well, you know, let's go ahead and go there. <laughs> I see, because you're using your prophetic powers again, I see. Um, well, anyway, so this is, uh, yeah, I'm um, very pleased you could join us. And by the way, everyone, my name's uh, Jem. I'm the founder of the Deep Adaptation Forum, and I wrote the, uh, the Deep Adaptation paper, which uh, sort of completely messed with my life. But anyway, um, uh, <laughs> it means that I get to have amazing conversations with amazing people. So, da, thank you. Um, I've been looking through, uh, I've been speed, I'm a slow reader. I've been speeding up my reading. And I was, uh, I was seeing that really this, this book of yours um, is an invitation to witness life passing, ecosystems passing, uh, to really sink into that loss. Um, and I know many people do that in order, to, almost like a call to arms, like a, and so we must do everything to protect what's left. So I'm really wondering what called you to to bear witness in the way that you have uh, all this terrible loss tragic loss around the world um i don't get a sense it's the same kind of call to arms as we often hear could you tell us about your motivation for writing the book the motivation wasn't to try to inspire any kind of call to arms or promote activism or save the planet or anything like this it was really from a place of, I, I, I personally had been witnessing the loss for quite some time, having spent a lot of time in the mountains of Alaska and on glaciers, as well as having been on the Great Barrier Reef and seen the changes over the years in other places around the world, and regularly spending time outside new, we're already very, very far along in this crisis. And so the sole goal of the book was to bring people as up-to-date, personal, visceral, and scientifically accurate uh, model of where we are from these crisis points. Uh, hopefully that people would then understand more in the, their body than even in their mind of what that really means, and then put the book down when they're finished and then go out to wherever they connect most deeply on the planet and reconnect in. Not to try to change anything, but to really take in the gravity of the crisis and to love what's here while it's still here. So an invitation to really reconnect and appreciate uh, uh, for, for people where, where they're at. And so reconnect with nature and, and creativity where they're at. Um, I'm wondering where that comes from. Is that, is that because of how you have been finding a way to cope or even rejoice at this time? I think it, it, it originally came from uh, my own way of trying to find a path to cope and ingest and process what's happening. And um, a really a deep, personal urge to go be with these places like the glaciers in Alaska where I've spent so much of my life and places in the book several of them I'd been before and had long-term relationships with like the Great Barrier Reef in Australia and like that for example literally going there um, back to the Great Barrier Reef and showing up literally the first week of a major coral bleaching event in in 2016 and understanding that this was probably going to be the last time that I saw the reef. And so literally going to say goodbye and, and being very privileged and fortunate to have that opportunity to go say goodbye to the single biggest coral reef on the planet, which now we know full well will most likely be gone uh, before 2030. 
in other places where I went in Alaska, where I went back to see glaciers that I used to climb on and they were already gone. And then showing up in these places and literally feeling that like a gut punch and, and standing there and saying, okay, this is, this is gone now, you know, and this is, this is a new world now and really getting to process that personally. And so I feel the book having afforded me that opportunity to do that in places like the Amazon, those which I mentioned, Sequoia National Park in California and numerous other spectacular places and, and really, really understand what that really means to be losing these, these, these critical parts of the planet. And, and then for me personally, how is that going to inform my life going forward? Yeah, um, listening to you then, um, I felt what I would label sadness and grief, um, a tightening in my stomach and uh, a pressure behind my eyes. And through picturing you where you said you were in your process, but also immediately relating it back to the ecosystems and landscapes and ways of life that I love, or just had come to um, assume was the backdrop, or was always there when I wanted it. Um, so, so yes, your book and also your experience, it tells of your experience, which is about loss, about grieving, about saying goodbye in a honorific way, perhaps. So I'm wondering what is most, because you, you write about this, you talk about this. This is um, unusual to stay in that way of looking at the world, or at least it might be unusual for our culture and our time. I was wondering what, what's most alive for you now in climate-related grief, in terms of how, where have you got to with these feelings and this outlook? The book really forced the issue for me, uh, literally coming back home from these trips with these photos and these imprints in my body and my psyche. And then all of the data and writing about it was so intense that I would literally sit, I was sitting here doing it in this office and I would have to go out sometimes and just stand with the trees and just breathe, you know, understanding the gravity of, of what's happening. And it really caused me to find this very, pretty, pretty disciplined process of, you know, meditating every day, uh, being quiet, uh, being outside at some point every day, going on more intensive trips into the mountains every weekend, talking with friends who understand what's happening and processing all of that. A pretty, a pretty, you know, serious and consistent milieu on a regular weekly basis, just to kind of stay above water, you know, just to keep my nose above water enough where grieving and keeping a balance and being able to do the work. And what I found recently after taking too much time not in nature, I just start spinning out again and uh, into depression, uh, into anger, uh, into numbness. And, and then last week I took basically the better part of the week and went out again into nature for four days straight camping. And and then got my feet back on the earth. And so that's what I've learned is that it's a daily, if I'm really being emotionally honest about what's happening, um, it's a daily adventure with grief as well as um, a deeper love for what's here, what's still here. And, you know, daily uh, processing in some way with some friend uh, some part of the crisis that's either, you know, scaring the hell out of me or enraging me or leaving me just deeply hollowed out, saddened by loss. Yeah, I relate to that because there's one thing to allow this perspective to come crashing into your life and destroy old stories of progress, of tomorrow, of self, of purpose. But it's another thing to abide with that, to like be with that day to day over time without withdrawing, becoming numb, blasé, 
or just over busy, motivated by an anger and a desperation. And, and for, so you, in your experience, you're saying time in nature and meditation. I think those are the two things that I've, you've really put your finger on there. Are they, is there anything, anything else? Um, I mean, for me, I, I, I know I need that too. Um, I'm wondering, is there other, is there other stuff that helps you live with your outlook without those pitfalls that you describe? Well, those two things are critical. And then the third equally important with those is, is talking with friends like that really understand uh, where we are in the crisis that, that aren't pretending that there's, we can reverse it or draw it down or mitigate, but that really all that's left to do is adapt and, uh, and, you know, and then making decisions from that place, you know, and, and, and usually that means people that the people I relate the most with that I've, I've noticed a pattern over the last year having lost my best friend in, in September, which really dropped things down to an even deeper level for me, sitting with someone as, and helping them die, uh, is, is it's other people who've experienced that as well. Um, really a deep personal loss of a, of a loved one, whether it's their partner or uh, a parent or a close friend. And, and um, I, I relate now a lot more to those kinds of people because it's perfectly analogous to what's happening and literally how it feels now when I go out into an area nearby my home and some of the glaciers I go to that, you know, probably won't be there in another 10 years. And it's, it's a similar experience. Like, you know, I still see the beauty, the love is there. And it's, it's really brought into a crystal focus knowing how uh, temporary, how extremely temporary it is too. Yeah. So the, the connection I'm hearing there between loss in a, a way that uh, it's more sort of normal for everyone to experience, such as grieving a relative or a close friend, the connection there with climate related loss is um, that it, it reminds you of the love that you have. Uh, but I was wondering what, what else can we, what else can we learn from the more normal forms of grief prior to this sort of catastrophic uh, ecological situation we're in, such as losing your friend? I think really the importance uh, in, in, in the book, the process of my book, and then coming to the conclusion and trying to figure out where to go with all of this knowledge and information of, of really understanding the importance of endings and doing them the right way, uh, whether it be talking with someone about it, sharing it, or having ceremony, but really marking endings, really understanding what it means that when I see a polar bear now, I know that, you know, assuming I don't uh, have an unforeseen early death, <clears throat> that that will go extinct in my lifetime. And I'm, I'm one of the last generations of humans that it's going to get to see that, that animal alive and, and really noting that. And, and I think that that's worthy of finding a way either internally or in community of having ceremony for, for things mm. like that, that are going away. And as, as well as things that, you know, have just come to mind that uh, have just left the planet, you know, more recent extinctions that are happening and ongoing. So when someone dies that we know, sometimes part of the grieving can be not only a celebration of their life, but also a recognition of what they've contributed to who's still around and therefore implicitly to society and culture and our current stories of meaning. I'm wondering if the kind of cataclysm that we're sensing from climate change adds an extra level of loss or grieving. Um, because that goes to potentially um, that that sense of the meaning of a life in terms of how it contributes. So if a species is going extinct, that's quite final. But if a culture is collapsing, that also there's no no one around to remember your loved uh, friend uh, or our par parents, for example, or our grandparents. So I was wondering, is there is there a quality? 
to climate loss that's different in any way? Or is that not the case? It's basically still grief and it's the same thing. I was wondering what your thoughts are on that. That's a really great question. And, and I think, you know, it's one that's going to stay with me long after we get off this call. Um, I, the, the, the thing that comes to mind is just the magnitude of uh, the scale of this. I mean, we're talking about every living thing any of us have ever known for our entire lives or read about or seen a documentary on, uh, or let alone what we've seen and experienced with our own bodies and our own eyes. But just the, the, the magnitude, the, the, you know, the gigantic scope of loss that we're talking about, of how everything's always been done uh, at this stage of the game on Earth to all the other species, to all the other biosystems on the planet, that everything is changed irrevocably. And uh, so many things are going away forever. And just, just to take that in and, you know, talking about a, a so-called normal grieving process, but applying it to the entire planet and cultures and civilization and languages and things like this is, is um, you know, I, I think about this pretty regularly, but on that scale, I think I, I would only do it in a direct conversation with someone that has experience that really understands that because it's, it's, it's a huge thing. And this, these, it was the thing when I first started having my early recognitions about the, the scope of this and what it means, you know, the very possibility of uh, our species going extinct uh, in a not so distant future as a possibility in everything that comes with that, you know, that it, for me, it kicked in a fight or flight response, like, okay, my, my ass is on the line. What am I going to do? And then realizing like, no, we're not going to get in our Teslas and drive to Mars. Uh, we can't leave. This is the one planet we have, uh, to live on. And, and then, and then the feelings come, okay, I'm stuck. What am I going to do? Well, after a long depression, it meant starting to figure out a way to adapt and uh, physically, emotionally, spiritually. Yeah, thanks. Um, <clears throat> I'm glad you. Um, <clears throat> I'm glad you gave me a full answer because I was. Uh, I was. No one else has brought me to tears in these Q and A's. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm, um, it is the. Yeah, it is that depth. Uh, scale and sense of finality which is very powerful and somewhat overwhelming um you mentioned about human extinction i was wondering what your outlook is on the possibility of human extinction this century and what that has meant for you and what you just were saying that at the the end well uh, i I um even in my book towards the end I do write that it's it's hard for me to see that humans don't go extinct from this crisis, um, and but what I've learned through my own process and it's been a long winding process of going from someone who absolutely believed humans were going extinct and I would debate you under the table about that given the opportunity um, to really realizing that while that certainly looks to be the trajectory that we're on and as i said it's hard to see that not happening um i i came to a place personally where i had to realize that i needed to have enough humility to uh understand that while that looks like it could be the case um i can't say that for sure personally uh, uh because there's so many different factors involved and so much happening that uh, it's, it's, uh, it's just impossible to say, and I, I personally wouldn't make that prediction. Um, that said, uh, I, I do feel very confident uh, in, in uh, saying that I, I personally believe that we are about to undergo a dramatic reduction in the global population in the numbers of billions, uh, probably well in advance of 2100. And, and I think, you know, civilizations, I think, you know, people talking about this in a future tense is a misnomer. I think we are in a state of collapse of civilization. Look at what's happening right now yeah. with, you know, coronavirus economy, mm. you know, everything just, you, you can literally feel that, you know, there's no more future tense about this. We're, we're in it and it's accelerating. 
and, and today's better than tomorrow. So for you, that, uh, that outlook is part of the process you've gone through that you've described already. I wonder, do you see any problematic responses that can arise in people from sensing it's probably too late for the human race or it's probably the beginning right now of a form of mega death in the billions? Are there problematic responses? And for example, some people might quote terror management theory whereby all of us at a deep level, unless we're yogis, have a, have a fear or anxiety around our mortality. And that drives us to want to contribute and be part of something that lives on beyond us and so our culture. And therefore, the argument is, is that if we feel mortality more imminent, we may be more likely to um, subscribe to the dominant stories of our culture um, as a desperate grasping for, for a sense of longevity. What, are there things that can go wrong from... Have you met people who say, duh, I totally agree with you, and the next thing they say horrifies you? What are the, what are the pitfalls? Um, oh, boy, there are many. Um, I, I think, you know, one that you just pointed out of, of that people get a kind of glance of what's going on and how far into the crisis we are, and then just, you know, well, but I'm going to just throw myself that much harder into my activism or uh, my job or whatever, you know, getting overly busy and, 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 and part of that busyness being overly busy and pretending that what's happening isn't happening. And I think that's very dangerous. I, I think another way uh, is people falling deeply into despair, despondency and depression, which I've spent my time in those places and throwing up their hands and saying, oh, well, what's the point if that's the case? And, uh, uh, or, you know, other people even celebrating it like, well, great, you know, they're so angry at themselves and the human race for causing this to the planet. Well, great, you know, bring it on. It can't happen fast enough. I think all those things are very, very dangerous. And, 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 but my perspective that I've come to more recently is that, you know, when giving talks on my book and being confronted with that, well, you make it sound so doom and gloom, why do anything? I argue now confidently that if, you know, we're in a place where all really is lost, it's like, it's like sitting at the bedside of someone that you love and it's there on their deathbed. Are you going to hold anything back at that time? Absolutely not. You know, you're going to tell them how much you love them. You're going to, they're going to see it in your eyes and in your body and in your presence and you're, you know, anything left unsaid, you're going to say it. You're not going to hold anything back. And I feel like that's a silver lining of this crisis where whatever it is that we each are doing to love the planet and care for it and be of service in our lives, uh, it's clearly the time to just let her rip. Uh, don't hold anything back. And I think, you know, those who are more activist inclined, uh, if you're not going to put your body on the line for what you believe in now, then you probably never will. Mm. So I'm wondering that I, I, what you've just described is quite similar to my own journey over the last 18 months. And I felt that I needed to, well, I would benefit from ways of becoming less afraid of my own death which starts with uh, recognizing that I might be subconsciously afraid of my own death and a lot of my uh, striving for achievement and contribution, um, wanting to be a good guy, all this might actually be connected to that. So, um, and I thought I was doing okay. And then after about two weeks of friends and family peppering with, with news about COVID-19 and prepare, um, and the amount of stress that everyone seems to be experiencing about how this is likely to be a pandemic and shut down the global economy and disrupt the availability of daily resources in my own life. I felt last night, I have to admit it, I don't think I slept very well last night with a fear response. And so I'm, it's all well and good, isn't it, intellectualizing, but how can we help ourselves and help each other 
into that place that you've just said, which is to focus on the the rejoicing and the honouring of of each other and of nature, and of being as loving and present as possible. How do we help each other not go back into that fear that I experienced last night as I tried to go to sleep? Yeah, and I, I can completely relate to that too, and because it's a balance between watching the horror show of what's happening in the news on a daily basis, whether it's, you know, the, 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 the lurching into overt authoritarianism in the U S and other Western countries or the, the COVID-19 or, or, you know, pick your, pick your crisis or your trauma. And it's, it's so challenging to take that information in, but then not get consumed by the emotions and kind of the fight or flight response around it. And, for me. And I, I still, you know, given on given the week and what's happening on the planet and how good of a job I've been doing personally to have my kind of daily um, self care maintenance routine in action. Um, I, I still find days where I literally have had to say, okay, just get out of bed, just literally talking to myself that way, like get out of bed, go do, you have these work obligations today, and then you're gonna need to go, you know, do this and, and do that and literally make myself go do these actions. And, and a part of that every day is that one thing that I learned from a, a Native American elder that I, I write about in my book is he says, look, there's, then this is a tool that I try to share in all my talks because it's one of the most helpful things to me. And he says, look, um, in settler colonial mindsets, there's this belief of, you know, we have rights. What are my rights? But in indigenous perspectives, they believe that in, in a Native America concept, that is, that uh, you're born onto the planet with two primary obligations. The first is to serve and be a steward of the earth. And the second is to serve future generations of all species. And so if I get up each day and ask myself, how can I be of service to the earth? And how can I be of service to future generations? Then there's no shortage of things that I can do to go be of service each day. Yeah, thank you. That's that helps. That helps me, and I think it will help quite a, a few people. I wanted to go back to when you said about experiencing depression. I think for some people, really truly waking up to where we're at is then waking up to. Uh, the destruction humans have wrought on earth and therefore a form of self-loathing as being human uh, and a form or if not a form of alienation from every other human this kind of hatred about who are we who am i i was wondering if you've you had any of that and if you process that in some way i th i that's a really fine articulation of, of the feeling that, that I, I wish I'd heard that articulation a ways back when I was going through that. Um, because that was, I think, part of my depression is because depression, right, is like unexpressed anger or sadness, at least my experience of it is. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, the sadness, I think we've talked about, but that anger of uh, my own hypocrisy, you know, I mean, I, I drive a vehicle that burns fossil fuels. I still use airplanes from time to time. I mean, I, I, I do what I can. I reduce my carbon footprint every year and all that. I have a solar powered house. I have, I grow most of my own food now, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I am still chock full of my own hypocrisies. And, and that brings up anger and that brings up my own uh, other feelings around that. So I think, yeah, that anger at us as a species for having done this to the planet, that was the big one, you know, even kind of getting outside of just talking about me and just the anger at humanity. And I think that was part of me, uh, you know, my, my lack of resolution of that was what was driving, I think, some of my uh, thinking of, oh, well, for sure we're going to get extinct. And part of it was anger, like, well, it serves us right. We'll get what we deserve. Yeah. And was it, did you come out of that because, of something else, not, not intellectualizing that away, but through just more time in nature, turning up the volume on the greatness of life rather than the shitness of it. What, what, how did you come through that? 
it was what you just said, uh, coupled with just look, um, it's not serving the planet and it's not serving future generations to sit around being pissed off or depressed or in despair and despondency that I need to have those feelings and let them come through. I think they're part of everyday life now for any of us that are really open hearted to what's happening. But then I, I don't want to hang out in those emotions any longer than I have to. And, and I do want to get on to serving and not to pretend like, well, everything's fine. Everything's great. And it's all about, Oh, it, I just need to feel happy, but it gets down to the brass tacks of, um, you know, one of the, qu another question that, I picked up along the way that I've brought into my talks is, you know, imagine ourselves on our deathbeds, wherever that is in the future for each of us. And there's someone of a younger generation there and they say, well, what, you know, you were alive in 2020, did you know what was happening to the planet? And of course, we'd have to say, uh, yes, we were acutely aware. And then the next question being, well, what did you do? And so I want to be able to say that I did everything that I could. Uh, and for me, that means, uh, you know, getting proper information out to people. But then it also means working with younger generations, helping them uh, come to terms and process what's happening on the planet. What does it mean for them in their own lives? Uh, and then being a good steward on the land where I, I get to live and then going out and loving the parts of the planet that I, I love the most while they're still here. I'm pleased to hear that you uh, outreach to young people and uh, that's good then that I uh, show your book at the start of my film, Oscar's Quest, where I also reached out to young people. Uh, I'm just going to let everyone know that we're going over to questions after my next question, so in a, just a few minutes. So please, if anyone has a question for D Dar, um, uh, please send it to, to Matthew, who's named himself uh, questions here, please, um, so you know where to send them. Uh, and please do that now. Da, before we go to the other people on the call, well, what you were just saying at the end, I think partly answers the question that some people put to me that is, I hear your love of nature and your pain at its loss. I hear that you are suffering from some kind of anticipatory grief. Um, but isn't that self-indulgent, given the number of people who are dying now through climate uh, driven or climate things made worse by climate um, so for example malnutrition in Africa um, the spread of diseases because of climate uh, and and you know guys get over yourselves um, no one's going to thank you for doing your own spiritual processing in 2020 uh, in years to come they will have, uh, you know if you had got out there and tried to do your very best to stop the worst case scenarios, uh, then they'll be grateful for that. So get over yourself, stop being self-indulgent. What, what would you say to, to that? Well, when I say be of service to the planet, that of course includes humans and all species, but it does include humans. And I, I you know, I, I can't, I, you gotta have it to give it away, right? So I can't go try to be of service to someone else if I'm uh, don't have uh, something to help them with. And, and if I'm stuck in my own anger and depression, uh, I'm not going to be of much use to anybody or anything. So hence the self-care part. But point made, it, it's absolutely not a time for self-indulgence. And I think being of service means really, uh, you know, uh, use your imagination, right? I mean, I, I work uh, with pizza in, in one instance of my life, without divulging too much, I, I go work with other people far less fortunate uh, than me in a nearby community where I live. And I do that on a very regular basis. And so there's myriad ways of being a service. And these are to other people. Some of them are uh, you know, uh, in jail or some of them are in other uh, difficult situations. And so you know, other people, they might find, yeah, I'm gonna go work in a, a homeless shelter. I'm gonna go work in a soup kitchen or things like this. And, you know, just like what you said, there's a, you know, recent st statistics show that there's a, a new climate refugee every two seconds somewhere on the planet. Uh, it, and it is, it's, and, and this is a, a, a major crisis and it's going to expand. And so uh, obviously helping other people is an imperative part of helping the rest of the planet. 
Thank you. Okay, so we're going to go to questions. The first is uh, Brennan. Uh, if you say where you are in the world, Brennan, and ask your question to Dar. Thanks, Jim, and thanks, Dar. I'm in Massachusetts here in the United States. And um, thank you for your book and your speech at the Lannan Foundation, where I first interfaced with your message. My question is born out of the statement you made earlier tonight, where you were talking about if someone was on their deathbed, you know, wouldn't you just go full out and expressing your love? And um, out of everything that's been said so far, that's really touched me. And I, I started to get curious about whether imaginings of a post-collapse world um, ever spontaneously arise as part of that love. And if so, if, if that's something that you consider part of your expression of love, um, what those imaginings include, what they might picture, how that could come across for you. Hmm. I, that's a really great question. Um, what really came up in me was, was something that happened right here where I live yesterday, where um, there's several of us, uh, some of us who live right here on this land and, and, and uh, one person who doesn't, but it's part of the community. And we have a, a very large garden and we were sitting here talking about, okay, we have to figure out what to plant when, you know, these things are time sensitive. And then we realize we're behind the, the, the timeline on planting potatoes. And so spontaneously, two of us are out there literally digging in the dirt, planting the potatoes that we had. And, and uh, it was a, you know, it got done. And then we had a great meal. Um, we ate leftover potatoes from last season and uh, I had a great conversation. And, and it, I realized that it, it really was indicative of what's happening to me is I'm feeling a stronger desire to just root down in where I am and travel less and do less public activity and just really, these are my core people. These are my core uh, community. And this is the land that is taking great care of us while we try to our best to take care of it. And let's just grow food together and talk about what's happening and then, you know, we have a movie night. We have, you know, we might, uh, you know, we have a, a, a special way that we um, say a prayer together each time we do break bread together. And just, just little core basic things like that. But that ties into the deathbed stuff because having lost close loved ones, most of us can probably think back and some of our nicest memories are just sitting around having a tea with them or having a meal or a certain conversation, it always comes back to really the basic living stuff. And I think that again, is the silver lining of this whole crisis is it really underscores how precious life is and how amazing everything on this planet is in nature right now. And, and uh, just brings it into this focus of, okay, let's, let's live. Thank you. And our next question is uh, Sasha. Please uh, unmute and um, say where you are. Um, I live in the Ozarks in the United States. I'm in Missouri. And yeah, thank you so much for your sharing. Uh, so heartfelt and uh, resonated so much with what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And what I'd like to ask you is that for a long time, I've been interested in the idea of the Jaya theory that the earth is actually its own living organism. And we're more or less a, you know, just a part of that living system. And, you know, for me, that feels very real. And so I sometimes wonder, well, if we, if we see the earth as more than just this material object to which these physical things are happening, then how, how do we take on how it might be processing or participating in this experience? Yeah, that's, that's a really great uh, point. And uh, I, I think I was having a conversation with a friend, uh, a very close friend of mine here the other day about this, that because we we're both talking about some days we just get up and are just sad, just deeply, deeply sad, even if we hadn't like read news that day. And it's because we're as, as you just said, in, it's, you know, right in line with indigenous perspective is that 
you know, we are part of the earth, the earth is part of us, you know, all my relations, you know, there is no difference. And so if, you know, given how much the earth is suffering right now, how could we not be sad on a regular basis? You know, how could we not be struggling with all these feelings? I mean, maybe in that sense, we're, we're processing some of it for and with the earth, you know? And, and so that's what, that's what really, I think, strikes me about that, it, 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 along with the really hard and scary parts of that, you know, looking at the, the spread of the coronavirus or other things like this and other diseases now being released from the permafrost where, you know, we as a species fail to keep our own population in check. And so nature is going to do that for us, just like it would any other species that gets out of control as nature, you know, things happen and that species gets brought back down to right size. And I, I feel like now that's what we're in the process of experiencing as well. Thank you. We have a question from Karen. 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 Yes. Hi, Dar. I am, am here in Santa Fe, and I just wanted to acknowledge that hearing you speak, I think it was about a year and a half ago here, was really, really important to me because you spoke what I had been feeling, and it was hard to listen to, but I really, really appreciate um, your work for that. Very important to me. When you speak about grief, uh, Stephen Jen Jen Jenkinson has talked about the situation we're in as not being comparable to being in a hospice situation as some people talk about because this is really about what he says is human beings and human society spinning out of control not knowing when to stop having to have more and more and more and he makes this distinction about that and i know in my own experience of grief of people i've lost and animals i've lost that in that grief process um there was always something that I could hold on to, whether it was some kind of a belief, some kind of sense that um, things continued, life continued, and death was part of life. And this is just so confusing because it's on such a huge scale and it's happening in the way that it is. Now, for me personally, that distinction that Jenkinson made has been kind of significant in helping me if I have a passion, my passion right now is to be as present as possible. And I feel that presence is what I can offer and to really face what's happening. It's been very important to me, but I was curious what you think of that, of what he, he is saying about the, the place that we're in in terms of grief. Yeah, it's, it's complicated. I mean, I, I am... Uh familiar with a lot of Jenkinson's work and actually quote him in my book because uh, he's shared some extremely poignant things about um, what shall be the manner of our failing, right? And, and, and things like this that he's spoken of. Um, but I, I think that uh, my perspective is that we are very much in a hospice situation. I mean, we know for a fact that we're losing between 150 and 200 species a day. And, and we can, you know, off the top of our heads, probably several of us on this call could think of several just like that, like I mentioned the polar bears earlier, that, you know, there's, there's no way they make it through this century. And, and so um, that is a hospice situation. And we know that, that uh, these, uh, you know, the Great Bear Reef, other huge parts of the biosphere, um, most likely the Amazon before the end of the century are are going away. So that, you know, just for, biologically speaking, for me, for me, it's hard not to, to think that we're, we're not in a hospice situation and, and possibly even with our own species it well. But I, I really appreciate what you um, shared about presence and the importance in your, your drive to, to be that way. I think that's a really critically important thing. And I want to, I actually included a uh, a, quote, a quote from Thich Nhat Hanh in my book, because he talks about the value of being present, what's happening on the planet. And he said, when your beloved is suffering, you need to recognize her suffering, anxiety, and worries. And just by doing that, you already offer some relief. Thank you, Dar. And uh, we've now got a question from, or two from Michael. Over to you, Michael. You say where you are as well. Hi, Dar. Nice to see your face. You too. 
Um, Dar, I'm, I'm curious about... Curious train. What's that? Curious train. Oh, yeah. I'm curious about uh, your journey out of journalism um, because it happened really at the peak of some of your recognition around your book. And I know for me personally, there's this dance around how much I stay in contact with the news and what's going on and how much I withdraw. Yeah. And I can imagine you withdrawing from journalism. Part of that was wanting to step out of the, the constant inundation, which is a different story every day that we might get that's depressing on one level. So I'm wondering about your own journey with that and your move away from journalism and how you negotiate the news in this place. Yeah, that's a really good question. And, and I, part of it, my, my decision to withdraw from journalism was burnout from 16 years of being on deadline essentially, but then uh, really the core of it was um, I was super saturated with heartbreaking news about the climate every day. And, and then my job was to literally archive, catalog, rewrite, articulate that. And um, it got, I was writing these monthly climate, I call them the climate disruption dispatches for the website where I wrote Truth Out. And um, it got to where the last several of those I did, I, I wrote them once a month. Each, each time I did one, it felt like I lost a quart of plasma. It just killed me to write. It, it was like doing a dissection on a loved one that was already in the throes of pain, you know, is what it felt like writing about that information about the planet. And so um, I have um, with, withdrawn, you know, I've stopped journalism uh, overall. Um, I can't say it's been a completely clean break, but I've, you know, I'm definitely not doing it full time. Um, and, uh, uh, I, I still find, you know, it's an interesting dance with how much information I take in. Um, I've tried things from like, I don't read any news on the weekends if I'm being good. Uh, and, and the, uh, the other thing I've tried more recently off and on, it works to great effect when I practice it is there's no sense to read any news past 10 AM. Um, right. That I was just going through the day, kind of like re traumatizing myself rereading a story or maybe get, maybe getting an update when in reality, just like a bad soap opera, if you know, if you don't read it from 10 on, you're really not going to miss anything. And I found that helpful too. I could at least get a general beat of what's going on and then just go out into my day and you know, how can I be of service? Yeah. That's, wow. That, so, uh... <laughs> that's really, really helpful. <laughs> that's really helpful. So, uh... I know. Um, you know, just doing the, the podcasts that I do, I have this sense of needing to stay up with the news, you know, so I, there's something, uh, but staying up with the news is such a heavy weight to hold as well. It is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, journalist says, don't read the news. Headline shocker. In Dar <laughs> there. Yeah, that is a good, good, good idea. Um, I'm wondering then, Da, with where you've got to, if that you're, some people are arguing that, and some people are choosing a path of contemplative or spiritual activism, or just contemplative and spiritual practice and outreach. Uh, is that, is that something you would say that you're now uh, embarking on, perhaps even just without, or, or rather that it's sort of coming to you? Um, uh, even without a conscious effort in that direction? Without a conscious effort in that direction, it's, it's come to me, but more in the form of, of uh, service work. Uh, like, I, like I didn't go seeking out young people. They just started showing up in my life, one of them being a nephew, another one being a friend, another one being the son of another friend. They all the all of a sudden, you know, within a year, I had several young people that I was having very frank, honest conversations with. I didn't seek that out; it just came to me. Uh, in the same way, now with what's happening very organically on the land of working with, you know, several other people who are really, really emotionally and in, invested in gardening and taking care of the land here and growing our own food, and it just started to finally happen after kind of trying um, mistakenly plugging wrong people into it at wrong times and things like this. It just started happening, you know, and, and 
once I walked away, you know, once I literally walked away from journalism and kind of freed up space in other areas of my life. And I mean, I do still um, engage in an essay here and there. I do have another small temporary journalism project coming up about an issue that I really care about. And I, I do have another book contract lined up to co-author a book with uh, a Native American elder uh, of, of, of about some of this topic that we're talking about here, but from a Native American uh, experience. So um, um, I haven't, I'm not stopping writing. And uh, it is funny though, is once I, once I did step away from journalism, the book has been nominated for some pretty big awards and it's shortlisted for a pin award and things like this. And I find it quite ironic now that I'm not identifying myself as a journalist anymore. Right. So, uh, Dar, is there something that's really important to you that you, that you have, that has come up that you haven't shared in this, uh, almost this coming up to the end of the hour now? Um, you know, Jim, you asked phenomenal questions and, and this has been a, a great and evolving conversation for me. And I, I really can't think of anything off the top of my head that is left pressing right. that we didn't cover. So, um, we do have one more question and uh, I don't know the lady's name because unless the name, the name is Sm Smasino. Um, I'm presuming that uh, you have a different name, Smasina, if you could ask your question of Dar. Um, can you hear me? Yes. So I'm just wondering if you suddenly... What's, what's, your, na what's your name and where are you from? Oh, it's, it's Susan. Susan. Um, Hi. Hi. Um, I'm just wondering if you woke up tomorrow and you were suddenly the leader of a community that's not facing imminent flooding or pandemic or starvation or anything super horrible. Um, what would you try and really kind of focus your collective community action on? Um, protecting nature, food security, health, spiritual work. I'm just wondering if you have any ideas from your work um, with Native American communities or your own personal ideas. That's a great question. And I, I think, you know, again, it's one of these things that's kind of started happening organically where I live, where, and, you know, full disclosure, Susan's a, a friend has actually uh, visited where I live and um, really orienting ourselves to like, okay, let's do our best to take care of this land that's take care, taking care of us right where we live. And that includes, you know, the health and welfare of the physical land itself. Is it protected? Is it cared for? Is it clean, et cetera? And then our own, you know, are we, can we grow enough food here for ourselves to be as self-sustaining as possible? Um, what are our energy needs? Can we, you know, in finding a way to do that cleanly, what about water, et cetera, et cetera. And then from that place, be, being able to kind of reach out and support the community. I mean, I, one example I could give is the last couple of seasons, the, the garden here has produce so much food that we ended up giving a whole bunch of it away to the local food bank. So, you know, if we do a really good job of taking care of ourselves, then that puts us naturally in a position to then being able to go out and start serve others around us, you know, so, and, and I think organically, that's the one thing that makes sense. And I think uh, going forward into a increasingly dystopian future, I think that would probably be best case scenario. Thank you. Um, we've uh, come to the end, Dar. So thank you very much for, for joining us. And uh, thank you everyone who's joined from around the world. And uh, uh, the video of our Q&A will be on my YouTube channel, which is just put in Jim Bendel to YouTube. And then you'll see all the, the past Q&As as well. So Dar, thank you once again for, I'm, I'm, I think this is one of the interviews I've done, perhaps the first, where I want to sit down and watch it again, <laughs> just to listen to you again and reflect and learn and integrate because I definitely still have quite a long way to go. Maybe I'll always have a long way to go and never get there, but it's certainly in this direction I need to go. Thank you and thank you everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Jim.